we're going to get started with this workshop. This is Managing Finances During Crisis. Uh, we're going to spend the next 90 minutes together, and uh, we'll be done by five. And uh, I'm just pleased to see uh, so many people who indicated interest in this, and all of you who've jumped on. Uh, I really believe this is going to be helpful. And uh, what we're sharing today are just really tried and true principles from the Bible um, and from just life and success thinking about money and, and how money works and uh, what how we ought to be thinking about and handling money when it comes to a crisis like our world is facing right now. If you think about it, this is actually only one of a very few world events that's ever happened uh, in history in terms of the, the, how widespread this crisis is. Uh, really, uh, you, could, you could look back and even go to something like World War II, which obviously was hugely devastating. However, there were people that lived during a time of World War II that never even knew it was happening. And what's happening right now is that because of social media and the interconnectedness of our planet, um, everybody's being impacted by this one uh, virus and this one event. And all of the economic fallout and, and health fallout that's happening, we're so connected in this. Um, the only other time, really, that all at one time in history, you could say that something affected every person on the planet at the same time would probably would have been Noah's flood. And, uh, and, and here we are experiencing something that everybody's feeling. So it's a big deal and it's important that we handle this right. And so we're gonna be talking about how to do that. I wanna just start off with prayer. We'll do some introductory things and, uh, and then we're gonna get into some teaching on uh, really how we ought to be handling our finances, okay? So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your love in our lives. Thank you for how you, you care not just about our spirit, but you care about our bodies, you care about our relationships, and you care about our finances. And we pray that we would thrive in this time. We wanna understand uh, how you've wired us. We wanna understand the purpose that you uh, created even the idea of money for. Uh, we wanna understand how to, how to handle things in a way that helps us to thrive and helps our families to thrive in this season. And we pray that you would be honored in this time and that we'd be built up in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm gonna do something now. I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna see if this works. So give me one second here. I'm gonna to get to the program that we're gonna be going through and, um, and then we're gonna share that. And so you'll be able to see what I see this whole time going through this. And hopefully this will be a blessing to you. So give me one second. Also, this is being recorded. And so we're gonna post this on YouTube afterwards so that you can access it again. And um, uh, if you can see what uh, I put up on the screen, Managing fi Finances During Crisis, the green uh, uh, graphic, will you just give me a thumbs up real quick? Everybody see that? We're all seeing the same thing? Okay, good. All right, so I wanna just uh, make mention of a couple of things. Uh, one, if you've got questions that you'd like to handle at the end, especially for those of you who are just joining in, we wanna do a little Q&A and bring in uh, my brother-in-law, Tim Wooten, on, who specializes in managing money, and um, he's going to help us answer some questions from a biblical worldview, and also just from a common sense perspective on, and we got some great questions ahead of time, so we're looking at those, as well as we'll take questions on the fly for the Q&A toward the end, but I uh, want to encourage you to do that through the chat. That's down at the bottom. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you can find chat, and you can just pop it in there, and we'll follow the chat to, uh, to look at the questions. Um, just real quick, look around the room. There's a great group of people on here that are, are all interested in doing well financially. And that's a good, that's a good thing to be interested in. Uh, and I wanna encourage you about that because uh, being interested in finances, I think sometimes we might think God doesn't like us to be interested in success or in prosperity. But uh, I think actually the truth is, is that the better we do, financially, as long as we do this in a spirit that doesn't tip over into greed, as long as we stay people who want to bless others, as long as we uh, teach and, and give and share, um, we can bless more people uh, with more money, yeah? And so why not do well in this time? And why not make sure that you have something that you can offer to others during this time? There's a lot of people looking for stability right now. 
So I, I would ask today that you and I make a covenant and agreement together. Let's be people who strengthen ourselves during this time for the purpose of strengthening others. Uh, God is going to use us in a big way if we'll do that. Uh, so I hope you're ready for this. I want to give you just a couple of quotes along the way about money. Jared Kent said, I think the key indicator for wealth is not good grades, work ethic, or IQ. I believe it's relationships. Ask yourself two questions. How many people do I know and how much ransom money could I get for each one? That's pretty good, right? Yeah. Uh, so you might know some people that you could, you know, uh, ransom off. But anyways, um, here's one. Money may not buy happiness, but I'd rather cry in a Jaguar than on a bus. I think I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree. All right. Um, and here's another one. It's a recession when your neighbor loses his job. It's a depression when you lose your own, right? I mean, you can look at the, uh, at the economy and go like, oh, bummer. People are struggling financially. But the truth is like when it hits your household, that's a different story. And we've got to be careful that we don't downplay even what others might be going through right now, because there's, there's a lot of people who are really impacted by this. Um, so uh, I, I guess I would ask you to just think about for a second, and maybe I'll, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to unmute everybody real quick. Um, maybe it would be worth just asking real quick, uh, how, who's, got, who's got something to share? Like how has already, how has this, uh, situation impacted some of the people who are on right now. Anybody I just to okay. Keep in mind that you're all on and we can hear everything that you're saying. Um, <laughs> and, but if somebody's got something they'd like to share, I'd be interested to hear how has this impacted you so far? Anybody? Has anybody lost a job? Anybody on the, the job lost a job? I lost my job, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it just puts me in a position of just reevaluating and prioritizing what I really need. Yeah. And I've always been one that's lived like that, but it's more at a deeper level now. Okay. But it's also um, putting me in a position where I can help others as well because yeah. of what I'm going through. Yeah, so that's how it's impacted me. All right, cool. Has anybody um, had to downsize uh, your standard of living? Has anybody um, had to make any, any drastic changes in your life since a month ago when all this stuff started to break loose with COVID-19? We haven't downsized or anything major, but we've definitely changed our entire routine. Um, I am on a forced leave of absence from work and um, have sewing skills. So instead of getting up and going to work, it's getting up and sewing and until you go to bed. And I mean, it's just that whole now learning to from home and sewing and working for myself and trying to set the boundaries and just kind of the whole different um, dynamics in that sense. Okay. All right, makes sense. Um, I, Taylor, I wanna follow up with you after this. There's somebody at the church has been asking if anyone is making masks for sale. Um, yep. So, all right, I'll connect you guys. That's, that's cool. Thank you for sharing. I think, uh, I think that the reality is that this is a big deal and will continue to be a big deal for everybody. And, and so uh, I would just encourage us to, to be mindful and think seriously about uh, how we're going to, how we're going to move forward because, you know, this is probably not a quick thing. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, I want to share, I want to ask you to do a quick uh, evaluation with me, um, and that is this, uh, rate your finances, okay? So take a second to rate your finances. The uh, smiley face means you're ship shape. I mean, never better. You got plenty of money in the bank, and um, you could go through a storm. Uh, the straight face is, could, could be better. Uh, you're certainly not... Uh, you know, out on the street, but it could be better. And the uh, the frowny face is out of control. 
I mean, you're living on credit cards, you don't have a plan, and you're scared. And you don't have to share this with anybody, but I want to just give you a, a chance to kind of get a, a, a sense of where you feel that you are personally and, uh, and start thinking about how do you get to a different place. Um, do me a favor, if you can, let's mute up now, and I'm going to walk through some stuff. Um, so if you could just mute your uh, self, that'd be helpful. And, and uh, I want to walk through this next slide. I want to I just let this image sit for a second with you. And uh, I want you to think about where you are and where you're headed. Uh, I want you to think about what this image might trigger. And feel free to share in the chat. You know, what do you think? What does this trigger for you? What kind of ideas does this give you? Uh, what do you want? Where do you want to be right now? Where do you want to be financially uh, when this COVID crisis blows over? Which is an interesting even, even question to ponder. When will the COVID crisis blow over? I mean, as you might know, on Friday, Florida lifted the ban on uh, uh, social distancing for certain beaches. And so uh, they, were, they were just, it was outrageously packed, right? So people are anxious to get back into a routine but each state is going to take their time that they feel is right to do that. Here's the problem is that right now uh, our concern is getting back to normal with our routine, but what's not going to get back to normal for a long, long time is our economy. And, and so I want to read something. It just goes like this. Our entire world just entered an economic downturn. This is not a short term blip. If you want to survive, thrive and be a blessing to your kids, and grandkids, being a good money manager will be a critical skill for the next few years. And so uh, I want to challenge you to start thinking massively differently about money than you were even a month ago. Because a month ago, uh, you might have just been able to kind of, uh, kind of fly by the seat of your pants financially. You might even still have a little bit of that left. But my hunch is that almost everybody is going to be in a position within just a few months where we're really gonna to have to start making some choices because the, uh, the kind of lag on impact that the economy is gonna have uh, on us personally, we won't feel it quite yet. Most, most of us feel it a little bit right now. Um, some people feel it a lot right now, but I think we're all gonna feel it in three to six months and we wanna be prepared for that. And so in order to get prepared for that, one of the things that um, I would like to do is, uh, is to just talk about three kind of time-tested recession-proof principles that uh, have helped my wife and I in our own personal uh, journey of finances. We've, uh, we've been married for 25 years, and it's been a wonderful 25 years. Our anniversary is actually in July, but uh, when we started out uh, married, we, we had almost nothing. Um, I mean, we had, we had love. We had, uh, I think, a 450 square foot apartment. We had all hand-me-down furniture. Our, our sofas were the most disgusting things. Um, and I only laugh now when I think back to what it must have been like for uh, my mom coming over to our place and seeing what kind of furniture we had because it was really gross. But um, it was what we had, you know? And uh, I remember our diet of Hot Pockets and Top Ramen and, uh, you know, stuff like that that we just lived off of because we were going to college, working full time, trying to pay bills and all that. Um, but I just remember thinking back then, like, we can make it, you know, we can make it. And we don't have to have tons of money. We don't have to, um, we don't have to live large, but we can make it. And we always had... Um, we always had something. We lived very simply and streamlined everything and, and you know, yet God always provided just a little something that we could enjoy. Uh, I remember so many times walking to the grocery store with cash in our pockets and, and having like a limit of what we could spend and watching God provide miraculously, in my opinion, uh, because as the guy that doesn't want to walk the can of tomato soup back to the tomato soup can aisle uh, because you went over on your grocery bill, um, we just, you know, we just trusted the Lord. And so many times we were just within an inch. I remember m multiple times it was on the dot to the penny. What we had in our pockets was what the grocery bill came up to. And God's just always been so good. 
um, and he will now too. And I think that's one of the things that we know that we can count on is that if you, if you are a follower of Jesus and, and if you have experience trusting the Lord, uh, right now you're not worried. If you don't have experience trusting the Lord, you might be a little worried right now. And uh, if you don't have a relationship with your creator, this might be an all out panic for you right now because you're on your own. And, uh, and so I want to invite you to put your trust in Jesus as your savior and as your leader, because that to me is the beginning of even financial security because he promises to meet our needs. Um, and so we're going to talk about some principles, okay? Just three principles that can make a big difference in your life and my life. And, um, and these come again out of experience, out of the Bible, and hopefully they'll be helpful to you. So here's the first one. And if you're taking notes, which I would recommend, um, you know, just maybe scribble this down. I'm just going to show you this picture. Think about what it might mean for just a second as you look at that picture. What is this time tested, recession proof principle? And when I say recession proof, what I really mean is that um, these three principles that we're going to talk about, these will work in a bear economy and in a bull economy. They will work in a boomer and a bust. They will work when you're, when you're totally poor. They'll work when you're totally rich. Paul the Apostle said, um, I've learned to be content whether I have a lot or a little, you know, whether I have abundance or lack. And he said, I've learned to be content. And what we know is this, here's the principle, is that it all belongs to God and I am his money manager. That's the principle. It all belongs to God and I am his money manager. You are his money manager. Um, you know, this, this is kind of the principle of stewardship, which is also the principle of ownership. If you've um, ever owned a home, um, you know what home ownership entails. And I was actually just having a conversation with my son uh, this weekend on a bike ride because he said, you know, I don't know if I want to uh, buy a house right away. When I'm when I get a little bit older, he said, I think I might rather rent an apartment for a little while, you know, because he was thinking he watches mom and dad, you know, have to fix stuff around the house and have to go back to Home Depot for the millionth time uh, in a project and all that stuff. And 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 yet he knows that if he if he was renting an apartment, he would just call the landlord and say, hey, this toilet's broke, you know, come fix it. And yet uh, ownership says, no, I'm going to I'm going to take ownership of this thing. Well, when when we realize that God owns it all and we're his money managers we know that we're responsible to him and uh and he has in that sense entrusted us with what he owns uh, i don't know if you've heard that phrase god owns the cattle on a thousand hills um he's he owns everything and what's cool about that is god and the stock market they don't they don't interact like if you go oh wow god god's value went down because the dow jones went down no, it didn't. I mean, God hasn't lost a single cow in this deal. He hasn't, he hasn't lost any sheep. He hasn't lost any acreage. He hasn't lost any crops. He hasn't lost any. God doesn't lose anything. And I love that about God is that he owns it all. I mean, if you picture the world in his hand, like we're looking at, there's literally nothing going on in your life that he doesn't know about and care about and have a plan for. And so when you realize that he's just so much bigger than us, he owns it all, and we're just his managers. Now, you could, you could have a little wrestling match with God, and I have before, where, you know, he's got that thing in his hand, and what do we do? We just try to take it out of his hand. We're like, no, 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 give me that. I want to I do this my way, and I want to achieve my purposes, and I want my kind of agenda. Um, and I've lost every time in, in that battle. Uh, sometimes... He, Here's the scariest part of that. He will, he will hand it over to you if, you if you insist long enough. And you know what happens in that moment? You realize how heavy it all is. That uh, this thing about providing for yourself, like there's a reason why God calls himself our provider. And it is because it is too much pressure for us to figure all these details out. This global game of chess is way beyond my pay grade and your pay grade. And it requires the care of a loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present creator that's personally involved in our lives. It, it requires his hand in order for us to have peace and to be taken care of. So I just want to share real quick three scriptures 
that, uh, that have really spoken to me personally throughout my life and have helped shape um, my own personal philosophy of finances. Um, the first one is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Again, if you're taking notes, you can jot this down. However, um, newsflash for everybody, I will be sending out some show notes for this. Uh, well, you, you're going to get everything that we're talking about written down, some helpful links and all that stuff as well. But Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18 says, He did all of this so that you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He's the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. He, he says, remember that you didn't give yourself the job. You didn't give yourself the skills to get the job. And it's all, it all really comes from God. And I think that's just such a good reminder that we would just take this deep breath and go, am I acting like uh, God owns it all? And am I acting like I am his money manager? Or am I more acting like, I have a kingdom, I am in my own God, and I will make my own way, and I won't answer to anybody. Uh, I can promise you the people with the second attitude are going to experience more stress and pressure and worry and anxiety in this coming season than anybody. And if you don't want that, uh, my, I strongly recommend that you hand the earth back over to God and that you acknowledge that he owns it all. And I'd so much rather be responsible to him managing his resources right now than feeling like all of that is on my shoulders. So that's just an encouragement for you. Proverbs chapter three, verse nine and 10 is another reaffirmation of this. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Um, he's going, you honor and then you overflow. I've taught that many times. First you honor and then you overflow. Why? Because there's a principle at work here, which is that God owns it all and I'm just his money manager. And so if, if my MO with money is to, to get as much as I can and, and scoop it all into my own lap and consider nobody and not be faithful in honoring God financially like he's asked us to over and over again, um, if, if that's my MO, then uh, what I'm going to experience really is, is him handing that to me going like, okay, you can make your own way. Uh, and it'll be more like scarcity than abundance. And so God's going, honor me. There's a way, there's principles, there's, there's a generosity involved in all of this. And there's this stewardship principle. Then in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21 is another one. And it's, this is the one where Jesus is telling the story about the talents and he, he gives this comparison and he goes, Hey, I gave, I gave one person uh, five talents. I gave another person two talents. I gave another person one talent. The person with the five talents went out and doubled it. Person with the two talents went out and doubled it, invested it for me. Person with one talent got so nervous that they were going to lose something that they just went and buried this one talent in the dirt. He said, when, when I came back to check on how my resources were being invested, he said, he, he went to the person with the five and here's what he said. He says, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And same response was for the person with two who doubled it. The, the person who went and buried the one talent though in the ground didn't take any risks and didn't uh, act as though they had a responsibility to the master. And he came back to that person and said, uh, you, you wicked, lazy servant. He's like, you didn't even have any sense of stewardship with these resources that I gave you. And uh, so it was a tough talk. And I think God wants you and me to acknowledge that it all comes, it all belongs to him and we're his money managers. And I think that's the first and most important principle really in su succeeding and thriving in this time of crisis. Because once again, uh, your health is a huge predictor of how you're going to do in this time. And I don't just mean your physical health. I also mean your spiritual and your emotional health. And you can't be spiritually and emotionally healthy if you're under too much pressure, the kind of pressure that doesn't belong to you. I mean, stress really comes from doing things you weren't meant to do. And that would include uh, being your own provider. And get, you know, hey, I get this. I, I was raised with a, with a work ethic that uh, was very strong. And so my MO has always been uh, make my own way, provide for myself, don't accept help from people. I mean, this has been sort of uh, a, a, a journey for me to grow into the place where I could, where I could um, not try to be my own provider. But 
I'm finding so much more peace when I just relax in God's care and just follow the principles that he's laid out and, and watch him work. It's so much more fun. So I got a couple of practical steps. And again, these are going to be on the show notes, but here's practical step, step number one. Uh, first would be, I would encourage you to automate your giving. If you want to honor the Lord with the first fruits of your, your blessings, as Proverbs chapter three says, if you want to honor and then overflow, um, why leave this to chance? Now, some of you, um, you might not have a consistent income right now. So it might not be possible for you to automate your giving where you could go online, even on our website, and you can log in and you can, and you can say, I'm going to set my giving to match my, my pay. This is what the Bible talks about, this proportional giving where you earn and you return. And it's proportional so that you can be a person who's, who's, who for sure is honoring God so that you can overflow. Uh, my family and I have done that. I, I do get a consistent amount every week. I get paid every week. So automating is easy. And, I, and, I, and I'll admit that it's easy for me because it's always the same. Um, but I don't want to forget about it. And, and uh, at the very least, I want to encourage you to digitize your giving because it's so much easier to take your phone and, uh, and do a quick gift um, so that you can, uh, so that you can uh, stay consistent with your giving. And in that way, you're honoring God as the owner of it all and as the manager of his money, as he's talked about, honor him so that we can overflow. So I would encourage you that. The other thing I would encourage you to do is to uh, make a budget. Um, in fact, let me first go, I want to show you real quick this. Uh, this is like our West Side's giving portal, okay, on our website. And you can see the uh, address at the top. But um, when, you, when you open that up, one of the things you can see is you can see um, the give one time and you can see the setup recurring. And, um, and so you can go in there and I would encourage you to do that, to, to be generous this way rather than haphazardly or um, rather than leaving it to the last thing and, not, and not, not getting to the point where you're honoring God in that way. Um, I believe with all of my heart that God's word is true. And have seen it so much, even this last 30 days, just in watching him provide for our family and for our church. Uh, many of you who are on, who are watching, you care deeply about your spiritual impact and your church's spiritual impact. And you've been a part of stabilizing our church in this time. I got to tell you, not all churches are doing well right now. And it breaks my heart to think that the gospel, God's good news, would suffer in this time. Um, a lot of churches are doing well, and I'm thankful that Westside is one of those uh, where we've been able to, even though we've, we've definitely had to cut expenses, uh, and we've been very diligent to do that, but we've been able to actually increase our ministry uh, in this time, and, and, and we're grateful. And that's really a reflection of what I think God wants to do in your individual life, too, is increase your ministry. Uh, the second thing I want to encourage you to do, practical step, is to create a budget. And I'm going to be sending you guys a link to this exact thing. I made up a pretend person and a pretend budget, but I want to walk you through real quick how this works because uh, I think that this could be the game changer for some of you right now. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe one person specifically asked for a spreadsheet. This this uh, is a simplistic one, but at least gives some ideas on what works. Now, this this come this is actually the exact same format of budget that I've been using for 15 years for our family. And why I do this personally is because I, I want to be able to know at the end of every week what dollar amount should be in the checking account, because that helps me to know if we're on track or not. And, uh, and so I wanna be able to pull this up on my phone or on my tablet or whatever, and just know at a glance, I do this every single day I look at this sheet to know are we on track or are we not on track? And I, I think in a time like this, that's the kind of diligence it's going to take to stay on track is, is to say, uh, you know, how are we doing? And have that constant check. It takes me about 30 seconds every day just to do a quick check on our finances. And if something's off, I would want to know right now so that I don't get surprised at the end of the month when I don't have my rent money. You know what I mean? I don't want to be in that position. Um, so here's kind of just a quick, real quick overview. And then we'll pause just for a second for some questions. But um, real quick overview of this thing. Uh, we've got over on the left-hand side, we've got weekly income. And this would be person one and person two, okay? We're talking about a dual income household here. Uh, and what we're, we're saying is that your income coming in is $900. That would be the cash in hand or the amount deposited in your bank account. Um, 
And then uh, what, what would come out of that would be, and here's what I believe, this is my own personal philosophy. We practice this right now and we have forever. We're, our, our giving is not based on our net income, it's based on our gross income. And that's a personal choice that I believe should be between you and God's spirit. But um, we've decided to, to give off of our, our pre-tax income. And, um, and we have a certain amount we give that has grown over the years well beyond 10%, but it's just been part of our lifestyle. We want it to keep growing. And so um, the first thing that we do is we automate our giving and it comes out first thing. That's the first thing that we do. I always believe that God's the first person I want to pay. Um, and the second thing that we do is we take money out for uh, groceries. We used to always do this in cash. We now actually don't do this in cash, but it's, it works out the same way. But, um, and then play money. Here's my advice. I know it's a crisis. I know you're cutting expenses. Don't completely cut play out of your life. Uh, all work and no play uh, makes what John a dull boy or something like that. Um, you know, you don't want to be that person who has no outlet for fun in your life. I mean, it could be 10 bucks a week. Don't cut this out completely. Have something in your life for play. If it means cutting your cable bill down a little bit so that you can have a little wiggle room over there, do what you got to do but I would not completely erase play from your life. I think that'd be a big mistake. So what that does is that means your cash expenses are, are 445. You deduct that from your total income of 1800 and you end up with a net weekly deposit of 1355. And so this is all pre-calculated in the spreadsheet that I'm gonna send you so that you don't have to do the math. You just plug the numbers in, but it, it will go up to the top on week one and, and your deposit will be 1355. And any additional deposits you can put in there so your balance is 1355. Then you've got your list of expenses. I just made some up. Some of these are actually our, our family's expenses. Um, so you've got college savings, uh, Netflix, Apple Music, T-Mobile. You know, you get these things, right? You might have to trim some of these in this season. Um, and then miscellaneous. But you know that at the end of week one, you should have $494.02 in the bank. And if you don't, there's a problem because you spent too much money. Um, and, and so that's a good check on that. Then you take that balance forward and, and that 49402, put it at the top of week two, add your net weekly deposit to that, end up with a balance of 184902, and then you can take that week's expenses out. You should always know when your bills are coming out and, and plan to pay them about seven days ahead of time so that you don't get a late fee or earn a bad reputation as a bad money manager. Um, instead, be early on those things. But you've got things in there that might include things like child support. Obviously, you're not going to be able to take that expense down, um, even in this time. Uh, over here, you've got uh, the, the same process going on. I just want to point out a couple of things. You've got even things like, think about savings. This is the time for savings. We'll talk more about that in a minute. you got your gas bill, life insurance. Don't cancel that right now. Uh, don't cancel that right now. That's You're going to need those things still in place. You realize how much more expensive it is to restart a life insurance policy after it's lapsed because it's based on your current age and medical situation. So if something's changed and if you've gotten older, that's not going to be $150 when we're done. It's going to be a lot, lot, lot more than that. So don't cancel that stuff if you don't have to. Um, and then you've got on the end, you've got the rest of it, but you end up, look at the, look at the end. Dave Ramsey says this, he says, name every dollar. Like you wouldn't want to have like $500 left over at the end of the month and just like, oh good, we have all this slush room. We can do whatever we want to with it. That'd be a big mistake because your discipline goes way down. So it'd be better to do something like, okay, we're going to put some of that money in savings intentionally, hold each other accountable for doing that as part of our budget. So I want to just um, pause right there and make one statement and then, and then talk for a minute with you. But Peter Drucker says this, and I love his style and, and what he says. He says, you can't manage what you can't measure. You can't manage what you can't measure. And you got to be able to put things down on paper or electronically in order to be able to manage them. Uh, and so uh, encourage you to be a person that plans really, really well. Okay. I want to just hear from you and we'll individually have you unmute, but um, give me some comments, some questions, some feedback on what we've talked about so far with this number one principle. God owns it all. It all belongs to him, and I'm his money manager. Anybody have any feedback or questions? Well, I'll go ahead and go, Gabe. Okay. So we, we've – this has actually happened to me um, in November because um, I'm on commission. We lost a huge account at work. Okay. And so I lost, like, I don't know, probably close to, like, 30000 
Okay. So it was really, um, yeah, that was for a quick moment, I would say I was in panic. <laughs> um, but I really had to check myself and remind myself that God's always had my back and he's always provided always. And, and so, um, anyway, so, but, but it really put me in a position. That's why I feel like I'm so prepared right now at this time. And like, when I looked at those, ha at the faces, like I'm the happy face right now <laughs> because God, I believe God took, cause now I've lost my job. So during that time, he was preparing me for this moment of losing my job. And in that time, like, you know, we make sure that our lights are turned off. If we are not in the room, our lights are turned off. We, I go to the grocery store with a master, um, with a master list. And those are the only things that we buy. Yeah. Uh, we completely only um, buy in the outer aisles. We don't buy in the inner aisles. If you shop in the grocery store, the outer aisles, that's all healthy food. The inner aisles is like more like chips and cookies and stuff. So we don't, I don't buy that. Wow. Um, I'm doing wrong. I just realized. I, yeah. Thanks and so <laughs> it really has helped me with my time management because we're only getting and using what we need. We do not let anything go to waste. We do all like meal preparations, anything that I notice is going to start to expire or maybe if I make a little bit too much of a meal, um, then I share it. I share it like with my neighbors. So I don't let anything go to waste. We only use very small portions of just say like even like laundry soap or dish soap or whatever it is. So um, anyways, but it, it has really taught me so much in losing that big chunk of money the first mm -hmm. time. But it also has, I felt like for me, God, it, God had prepared me for this moment. And in preparing me, he has provided like a whole power packet of resources so that um, he had provided that already so that I could go out and help people in the community. And then when that happened and I panicked for that quick moment and I thought, my gosh, what, what are we going to do? Because yeah. I had two, two things. I was like, okay, we need to make sure we don't go homeless. I'd never felt that way before. And uh, we need to make sure that we eat. Those were the two things. And then I thought, no, God, God has our back. He has never, ever failed us ever before. And like right now, like I totally feel like I'm at my richest. <laughs> hmm. That's what I feel like. I'm at my worst because I don't have my job, yeah. but I'm at like the best because I'm like the strongest mentally and spiritually. And now he's putting me in position of going out and walking like two hours a day where I'm getting physically fit and he's revealing so many other things. But anyways, I mean, there's just a lot of things that, that we do. We do not go out to eat. We don't go out to eat. We don't buy anything extra, but it has allowed for me to basically be out of debt because of it. So there's a lot of lessons that have happened that God's revealed to me from the time that I lost that big chunk of money to now yeah. that I've lost my job and I don't have to worry. Like I'm, I feel I'm, I'm at peace where I can just serve my home and serve God's people because of it, because of the lessons that I've learned in it. So for me, it's been a really neat experience um, that I've never experienced before. But I mean, for a quick moment, I was had in a panic, yeah. <laughs> in a panic. Yeah, but I had to put myself in check real quick. So, um, or God did it anyways. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. That's really great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments, questions? Quiet. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. And, and I realize that uh, some of you are probably on because you just go, hey, you know, it's not bad, but we want it. We want to get as good as we possibly can be right now. Some of you might be in a situation where you're going like, man, I, I really don't know what to do right now. And so just know that my thoughts and prayers are with you and, um, and I'm, I'm cheering for you. I know God can do this. I know he can get you through, as Lisa just said, and, and he will. 
um, we want to lean into his, to how he works. I think one of the most important questions we should be asking, not, not just what should I do, but how does God work? Because in joining how God works, especially in times like this, that's where the, that's where the peace is and the joy is, is that, you know, he, he reminds us so many times, like, hey, if, if I take care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how much more important are you to me? And he's going, so he goes, so don't worry about tomorrow. Um, he says, seek the kingdom of God and uh, his righteousness and everything else is going to be added to you. So there's that peace and joy of just going, okay, this is a season to go. Let's look at these unchanging recession proof principles and, and, and let's lean into them. You know what that does? That edges out panic. Uh, so much of the world is in panic mode right now. Uh, and, and so that is a panic is not the mode that the people of God should be living in. Uh, if we believe anything about what the Bible says about who God is, we can't panic because he's too good to, to drop us on our heads in a time like this. So my encouragement to you is just to um, lean into the, to the way that he works. Um, I do want to mention that I have some really great prizes we're going to be giving away at the end. One of them is a copy of uh, Randy Alcorn's classic, and I do mean classic book, The Treasure Principle. It is in many ways probably been the most impacting book I've ever read on the subject of money. It's also super short, you can see. So my favorite kind of book is really short, uh, but it's just, it's just absolutely got the best, most concise uh, written guide to living in an abundant life according to God's principles. So I hope you'll um, win that. And even if you don't, go pick it up. It's super cheap on even Amazon uh, because it's a tiny book. Um, then there is a gift card to the 649 Tap House that's here in Aloha. The reason why I got this is because I so believe that these guys have a heart for the community. And they've done this thing that I mentioned this morning in our service where they've opened up a soup kitchen and the, the price tag is pay what you want um, because they don't want anybody to go hungry. I think that is so stellar. And so I wanted to just point to them in this time. And then a uh, $25 gift card to Amazon. So this prize pack can be given away at the end. So stay on until the end. Um, and I want to jump in now to principle number two. You guys ready for principle number two? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready for principle number two. Okay. I see some thumbs. All right, here we go. Principle number two. Um, think about this for a minute. What do you see there? Uh, and think about what, is, what would this principle be? You know, this enduring, recession-proof, never going to change, not subject to the economy. This has nothing to do with how the Dow Jones is performing or not performing. Doesn't matter what Nike stock is worth or not worth. Doesn't matter. This is always going to be true. And it's going to work in the down economy. It's going to work in an up economy. And here's the principle is that you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. That's always been true. It is always going to be true. Every single day of the COVID-19 crisis, every, every single day of the next two, three, four years, however long it takes for the economy to get back out of whatever depression is, you know, recession, depression, whatever is coming, um, this will still be true. You reap what you sow every single time. And uh, Galatians chapter six tells us this. It says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You'll always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. So he says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, God says we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. And I think this just really reminds me that... Um, we're here to be a blessing to others. We're blessed to be a blessing. And, you know, the, there's something special and magical, I think, that happens when we do bless others. I'll bet you, in fact, I'd love to see on the chat, um, even, like, has anybody had that moment where they got a chance to bless someone and it blessed you more in return to be able to be a part of that person's life? I mean, how special is that when, God, when, when you realize all of a sudden that the loving God of the universe just used you as an instrument to bless somebody else? That is the ultimate thrill, I think. Um, it's, it's better than a big bank account balance. You know, it's better than a new flat screen TV. It's better than any of that stuff because God used you 
for something that was very special. And I think that's what this is about, is that you reap what you sow. Um, now you reap what you sow uh, in, in generosity. Jesus says, give and it will be given back to you. So in that sense, it would be foolish for us to expect God's blessing on our lives if we're not being blessable in the way that we're managing his money. Uh, in other words, if you don't practice generosity, you can't expect generosity back to you. And, and so I think that's a place to really begin in all of this conversation. Uh, and I'm not, and, and I realize this, I'll time out real quick. I realize, okay, yeah, of course, the pastor of a church is doing a financial workshop. Of course, he's going to say, you should give money to the church. So I'll call that out and maybe say whatever's been in anybody's mind, uh, if you've had that thought. And, and let you realize that, uh, let me just say, I, go, I want to go first. I don't want anyone to out-sacrifice me for Westside. I don't want anyone to out-give me for Westside. Um, I'm a big believer in the, in the mission of Westside. And uh, in case you're wondering about my motive, um, I've been giving uh, financially since I was a kid, not because it was some great thing I thought of. My parents just taught me to do it, and I, and I just grew up. It was just normal. And um, then I became an adult and realized it's better because God's blessing is on your finances when you do that. Because why? Because you reap what you sow. You know, if you sow generosity, you receive generosity. It's like a boomerang. Whatever you throw out, is coming back to you, you know? And, and so this is why this principle matters so much. Um, you reap what you sow in generosity. You reap what you sow in kindness, um, thoughtfulness to others. Uh, I know so many people right now who are out there. Uh, in fact, one of them is on this call. Uh, Joe and Priscilla Roberts, they are the sweetest people. They are so kind. They are so thoughtful. They are always watching out for other people. Well, guess what they get in return? People check in on them too. I mean, people want to know how they're doing too. People love talking to them too. Because why? Because you reap what you sow, right? And you reap kindness in, in return for kindness, thoughtfulness in return for thoughtfulness. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just part of how this works. But let me just say this about this principle. If we want to be able to continue to sow these seeds of generosity, faithfulness, kindness, you know, impact, uh, we have to be, we have to keep ourselves healthy financially. And, uh, and so I wanted to share some advice from Dave Ramsey um, that he actually wrote specifically for the COVID crisis and this time frame, because he, you know, he's obviously been around the block with money and he, he's seen people do some things that they shouldn't do with money. And so he's responding. And so he says a few principles. First one says to tenants. By the way, this will be in the show notes, so don't worry about writing it all down. He says, if the government says you don't have to pay your rent and there's a ban on evictions, you better do whatever you can to pay your rent. There will be a major reper repercussions when eviction bans are lifted. Don't think you'll get a, ride, a free ride out of this. Pay your rent. Your landlord has bills to pay too. Uh, that's just good advice, right? I mean, could we wiggle out of stuff right now? Yeah, but there's got to be consequences for it because you reap what you sow. He says to homeowners, if the government tells banks to stop mortgage payments, do whatever you can to pay your mortgage. Some lenders are saying you don't have to pay for three months, but on the fourth month, listen to this, all four payments are due in full. Do not take a chance and not pay. Major foreclosures will come from all this. The banks did not help homeowners in 2008 and 2009, and in 2020, it's the same. Pay your mortgage, he's saying. I'm going to skip a couple of these. Here's one. If you get a government stimulus check, this check is to help pay your bills. That means you pay your rent, your mortgage, your utilities, your insurance, your car payment, your bills. This is not for frivolous spending. Why? Because you reap what you sow. If you sow responsibility right now, you're going to get rewarded for that. He's saying this. He's saying the real problem is many who get the stimulus check won't pay their bills. Then will be crying and wailing and saying they evicted me. They cut off my power. They repossessed my car all while you're broken carrying that empty purse you bought with your stimulus check. And this is classic Dave Ramsey, all right? This isn't me saying this, but he says, pay your bills, all caps, exclamation points. There's always free cheese inside a mouse trap. That's what Dave Ramsey says. So I think that's really true is to think about, you know, how are you handling, even if you got a stimulus check, what did you do with it? Um, I would say it, it, it needs to be thoughtfully done, that we would be people who go, you know what? What if we need to help somebody in three months? What if one of us loses our job? What if, you know, do you remember a few years ago when the banks in Greece collapsed, like there was a bank crisis in Greece, people actually couldn't get cash. Do you remember that? And for a long time, 
people couldn't buy groceries. They couldn't get to stuff. Like, do we have a plan for those things? Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a doomsday prepper um, and by any stretch, but I also don't want to be caught by surprise. And so um, we have enough food in our house in case something like that happens. We, we, we keep enough, you know, we've got resources in case something like that happened. And um, I think, again, you reap what you sow. If you reap preparation, you'll, you'll reap the benefit of being able to help other people excuse me, if you sow preparation, you'll reap the benefit of being able to help other people when um, there's a crisis or a real shortage of some kind, and there very, very well could be. So let me give you some practical steps now in this one. Um, and again, all this will be in the show notes, so just listen. But cut non-essential expenses. I think, Lisa, as you commented on that, that's the kind of thing that we want to be doing. I mean, um, one of the things at the church that happened was we had, right before this whole crisis, we had hired a company to help us with some design pieces, some video, some graphics. And it was a subscription. So we had subscribed to this service that was going to be every month and there was a certain price tag for it. And then all this stuff happened and we got the announcement and we knew that we were going to need to start <clears throat> really looking at cutting expenses. So we did this thing called a subscription audit. Every subscription that we had from anywhere from the $4.99 a month for Evernote to um, $7.99 for this thing or you know, much more for some big services, we went through and we just chopped, 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 chopped them. If they weren't absolutely critical to making the church in this COVID crisis operate well, it, it went bye-bye. One of those things uh, was this design company. And I, so I called them and I said, hey, look, we're just gonna have to cut it. We, we just gotta do without it. And they said, well, stop, you know, would it make a difference if we build you 50% of what we were gonna build you before? And I said, yes, it absolutely would because the pieces that we needed were really important for the church. We just couldn't afford them. And so they gave me an idea. They said, we're running a crisis discount right now. And gave me an idea and I said, okay guys. So I started talking to our staff. I said, call everybody you can and tell them you want a crisis discount um, on anything and everything you can find. And so we started doing that. We even did that with our construction company that's, that's helping us with the remodel at the church. Uh, because we want to we want to save every single dollar we can to be as responsible as we can cut non-essential expenses not just so that you have less going out the door but so that you can build some reserves i think this is an important time for us to build some reserves in our life secondly would be communicate with your creditors like if you get behind on anything um, communicate with your creditors this would be uh true at any point in time um, and again, if you, if you sow good communication, you reap good trust and, and well, you know, uh, good wishes with a creditor. Um, you know, if you're behind on electrical payment and you don't say something, then what happens is they shut your power off. If you're behind and you say something, they give you a payment plan so that you can work it out. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember is communicate, 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 um, what's going on in your situation so that you can be ready for this next season. And then the last one is build an emergency fund or cash reserves. Um, I strongly recommend, uh, and I've always been, I've always poo-pooed a little bit how many months of reserves that, you know, they say you should have. Like to say that you have to have three to six months worth of cash reserves on hand, but the average American has $400 in savings. Uh, that's not going to last you very long, you know? Um, so, but in a crisis like this, you know, for me, I've looked at it and gone like, well, actually, three to six months wasn't a bad idea uh, to be able to say we could make it if somebody lost their job and the company closed down and the skill set that we had needed to be re I mean, if we needed enough runway for me to go get a new skill set and get a new job and be able to get back on our feet, that would easily take three to six months. And, and so thinking about what is it that you have in savings and even, even every dollar is helpful. Of course, Dave Ramsey's baby step in this area would be $1,000, right? Because $1,000 is at least enough to help you replace the tire on your car if, it, if you have a blowout or if there's an emergency with one of your kids to get some basic help. There's, there's things like that. Um, but three to six months would be enough to have a runway to restart if you needed to. And that's, that's really um, my new target, actually. And, uh, and so those who know me well, are probably laughing at me right now going like you've always poo-pooed that advice and now here you are saying it's a good advice well i guess uh, we all learn in things like this but uh, those would be some practical steps is is cut non-essential expenses communicate with your creditors and build an emergency fund um, and again those will all be in the show notes with some links on how to 
move forward in that. So that's the second principle. I'm going to open it up right now and just say, hey, do you got any, any thoughts, questions, feedback on that one that you would like to share? And you can unmute if you'd like to share something. Gabe, one of the things that I did is I went through like my, my car insurance, like I went to my, to my agent and I asked them like, what can we do, you know, to save money? Can we, you know, take a look at our, you know, at my account, my vehicles. I did that. I went to like, um, just, you know, I just went through my whole list of things and I negotiated yeah. and I, every single one of them, I can't believe like how much money I saved just in doing that. Yeah, that's great. I just heard on Friday from somebody that their insurance company automatically gave them a 25% discount on their car insurance last month. And, and mine did not. So my first phone call tomorrow morning is to my insurance yeah. company to say, hey, um, how do you feel about me switching over to this other insurance company? Because they're giving 25% discounts to all of their people. Uh, or yeah. would you like to do that for me too? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Was somebody talking? I got 20. Go ahead. Let me see who was that that was just sharing. I felt like it was going to be good. It's the one that says iPad. That was iPad. If you're iPad. I think he's cutting now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. but mine did, mine did when I went into the website for the car insurance, mine said 25% off because people are not driving as much. Yeah. So they're doing that as a courtesy. Yeah. Um, but mine says you don't even have to ask. It's just an automatic credit. Right. Yeah. 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 So I've got to talk to my people. But that's great. We found that uh, with our cable bill, we were able to do that very same thing, squish the price way down. So every, every dollar helps, right? It's important. Important time for that. Bye. Okay, um, let's go on to principle three. This one's gonna be different and I'm gonna need to explain it because it, it's probably not gonna be obvious in the beginning, but let me show you the picture. And just think about this for a second. There's a, there's a biblical principle that goes along with this picture and um, it's kind of buried in the book of Proverbs. It's, um, it's really, really interesting uh, what people are focusing their time on right now. And uh, I think Proverbs gets it right on this because it talks about um, it talks about what to do first and what to do second. So this is about the order of work, the order of emphasis. And so here's the principle that you can write down or it'll be in your show notes is, is barns before houses, barns before houses. That's the principle. And what Proverbs actually says in Proverbs 24, 27, it says this, it says, put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. I think that's interesting. Like if you were just getting started and you know, you, you, you go get married and, and now you're you know, going to build a family. And so you go purchase this plot of land. I mean, the first thing you're going to think about is where are we going to live? Right. But Proverbs says, no, 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 that's backwards. Barns before houses, because you want to develop the economic engine for your family before you develop um, the niceties for your family. And so if you think about what is this season uh, requiring of us, I think it's requiring us to innovate in the way that we, that we produce income. So to innovatively produce more income and to be a little counterintuitive in all of this. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is something that um, we learn from Dave Ramsey. We learn from, uh, actually what's an interesting segment of the economy right now is coaching. Uh, performance coaching, business coaching, um, personal coaching. That's a very interesting segment of the economy right now. It's not suffering. Um, in many ways, it's more in demand than anything else. And so what you might, some of you might even be involved in, in some of this where maybe you're a health coach or maybe you're a business coach or something like that. And of course, what's everybody asking? They're asking, what should I do? You know, so some of you might have the skills to put yourself in a position to offer like lower cost coaching than anybody else would offer. And so then to differentiate your services, because now you can say, hey, look, I'm not trying to get rich. I am trying to survive. And, and so I can help you survive as well. Because if you've got sound advice, if you've, if you've built something and you've got success principles to share, you could totally do that. I know a counselor right now who's branching out and is started to do free webinars 
Um, and this is going to be great because he's going to be able to serve a lot of people. And he's not doing this in any undermining way or any underhanded way, but he just knows that you, you reap what you sow. He's going to give a lot of free services and obviously he's going to get a lot of more contacts. And obviously people who want to pay for counseling services are going to know who he is. So he's basically, he doesn't call it this, but he's developed a sales funnel for his counseling practice. And I mean, this is an innovative time to start thinking like that. We can't, no, you know, nobody's just going to walk up to you. The only free thing you're going to get in this whole thing is the check that you probably already just got. That's it. And, and, and trust me, it's going to cost all of us a lot more later in taxes, right? Than what we just got. Um, so there is no free ride. Nothing free is coming to us. We've got to work. We've got to think. We've got to strategize. We've got to get smart. We've got to be creative in this time. The two words I've been telling our church team that we're going to uh, lean into during this time our staff at Westside is we want to be a creative and we want to want to be aggressive. We're going to be creative. We're going to be aggressive. That's the two things we're going to do right now. We are not backing down from ministry or we are not slowing down. Hey, listen, we did have to lay off some of our staff as a, as a result of this. That was just a necessary decision. Um, but at the same time, we're not slowing down the church. Um, the reality is we had to pivot into a digital space and that just requires a whole different thing. Right? So, um, but we want to be uh, creative and aggressive. And I would encourage you to do the same thing when you think about generating income for your life and for your family and for your future. Um, get as creative as you possibly can right now. Obviously, we want to honor God in everything we do. And obviously, we want to be good citizens in everything we do. And as long as the idea falls in, in that, you know, inside that definition, go for it, you know, get crazy about how you can do that. So uh, what I love, here's, here's a quote from Warren Buffett. He said this, uh, he said, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And what he was basically talking about is pretty much the prevailing wisdom is usually wrong. And, and so in a time like this, you, we want to be creative and aggressive. We want to look for opportunities to serve people and we want to look for opportunities to increase our, our income stream as individuals. Um, and that might, that might sound funny coming from a pastor, but I love the whole business world. Um, I have a sort of side business gig that I do helping other churches. Um, and it's, you know, at this point it, it doesn't pay well. Um, but it, it gives me an opportunity to serve other people and it does pay something. And so I've continued that and will continue to do that because I love it. And it also provides some for my family. Um, but you could do that with so many different things. And I'd love to just, maybe there's some creative ideas around the room even now that you could share with us. So if you've got a creative idea about how you get, um, how you build your barn before you build your house and how you keep that income stream coming in, let's, let's hear it. Anybody have something that you're doing? Uh, I guess, Taylor, you've got the, the masks that you're making. This is a great example of what we're talking about. Anything else? I go out, I go out, Gabe, and I help people organize and declutter their homes. Nice. And that's brought us extra finances. And then anything that they don't want, um, instead of taking it to the Goodwill, then I bring it with me in carloads. And then that's how I help the community with low-income families, their families, disabilities, single parents. So it's gone like full circle for me and being able to do that. But it also brings additional income into our home. Okay, cool. That's very cool. Love that. Anything else? What's, what are you doing right now to make extra cash? Yeah. Um, so my business is all face to face. <laughs> Not anymore. Um, it used to be, I belong to five different chambers and what I did, uh, you know, to create some information out there, I started doing, uh, sort of blogging. So I've been putting out a minute to two minute videos. Uh, I've been doing that now for a few weeks. And starting to get some traction, and I actually got a referral out of one of them. So, uh, just trying to recreate myself, uh, recreate my marketing. That's awesome. Love that. Anyone else? Um, for us, we um, we um, are investing in our backyard. We just got a new house, and um, we decided to start a garden. So it's not like um, you know, going to make more revenue, but it'll definitely save us money. So I'm like buying herbs or just like some vegetables and fruits. So that's what we're, we're starting to do this month. 
That's great. Yeah. Very cool. So we'll, we'll know where to go. You're gonna have a fruit stand we can come to soon? <laughs> no, the backyard's pretty small, so it, it'll be, it'll, it'll just be enough for our family of three. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's give any, one more. We got time for one more. What's an idea that you're pursuing right now to generate revenue in, in this season? Um, kind of similar to, was it Taylor that's sewing? So one of my things that I used to do when I was younger was sew. Okay. And I've been saying I want to get back into sewing. And so now that I have some downtime because I actually lost my job two weeks ago. Okay. Um, so I was like, this is a perfect time to start back sewing. And my friend, she's making masks, she's in Virginia. So we've been um, Zooming together so that she can help me get back into it. And then same thing with Julie, uh, Jules, we actually have started a garden as well. And the kids were like, are we gonna plant flowers? I'm like, no, we're planting food. So we can have our own food. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. So, Again, just kind of doing some things that's been on the list. Um, doing a lot of home things ourselves. Like I just repainted my downstairs uh, bathroom and I'm going to do the upstairs. Um, so versus hiring somebody to do those things. So we're also just looking at ways to save money yeah. um, for home improvement projects and things. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is that there are some things you should pay for. And, and right now is the time to do that. Like here's an example. We do have a little project we need done at home. However, I'm not the best person to do that. It will take five times as long for me to do this project as if I hire somebody to do it. Now, the guy I wanna hire is gonna cost $35 an hour to do this, but it will save me roughly 100 hours to have him do it, and it won't, it won't take him anywhere near 100 hours to do it. So I wanna take the time that he's gonna spend doing that, and I wanna build my own personal side revenue income stream with those hours. Does that make sense? I will actually make money by doing that. Um, because if I waste all that time, I mean, for one, I won't be available to my family or anything else, but um, also it just doesn't make sense economically for me to do that project rather than just hire him and then take the time I would be spending on that and spend it on the thing that I know I can, that I enjoy that's an investment in others as well. So that's, that's one of the things I've learned is to, to just kind of go like, wait a second, um, know, know your strength because it sounds like, Shauna, you've got some strengths that you can put to use. However, not everybody does have those kinds of tactical skills. I, for one, do not. And, uh, and so I'm just learning, like, but what do I do well that I can, that I can you know, use as an opportunity to, to bless other people and um, make a difference? So those are the two, the two pieces would be maximize your money stream. This is the practical steps for, for barns before houses. Maximize your money stream and invest strategically. That's something that we haven't talked about yet but I'd like to, and I, I'd like to introduce, um, in order to do that, I'd like to introduce my brother-in-law, Tim, who I think is on the call. Tim, are you on the call? There he is. So guys, this is Tim Wooten. He's my brother-in-law. And Tim, uh, why don't you give us a, just a quick introduction to um, your history with working, helping people with money, and, and, uh, and then let, we'll talk just for a minute about investing, and then we're going to do some Q&A. Do you want me to answer some of these questions that I've got? Yeah, let's first, first of all, let's just introduce yourself. And then, um, you know, when we talk about investing in an economy like this, share with us what your top thoughts are uh, for people as, as they think about, should I invest right now or should I not invest right now? All right, great. And uh, my, my internet's a little shady. So if it gets funky, you just kind of raise your hand. So I will repeat what I just said. Okay, you could just go, you could just go audio only for this part then, Tim. And that way we'll hear you for sure. Okay. Um, all right, we'll see how, how it keeps up. Um, you know, I've been in, uh, with a company called Transamerica for about 25 years now. So I've been an investment advisor for quite a long time. And um, I've been through the 2000, 2001 downturn, the 2008 downturn, and now this downturn that we just experienced. And most of you will probably notice that you saw a big dip about a month ago, uh, a little bit less, about three weeks ago, in your 401k. And if you kept your money in there, you notice that a lot of that has come back. Um, and that's typically what the market does. The markets dip, and they go back up, and dip, and 
back up. And so um, a lot of what I'm hearing from the inside scoop of, of the investment advisor world is that they believe that we're probably going to see um, a B. So we saw a big downturn and then seeing a B meaning we've come down and then we're going to come back up. Um, unless something just crazy, um, amazing happens that um, causes the market to just absolutely tank um, again, which would be something related to this virus because there's nothing else in the economy that was causing what we just experienced. Um, it was purely the coronavirus. It wasn't um, that unemployment was high, unemployment was super low, and um, things were really good. So it's a good time to be continually investing if you can. So if you have the ability to continue to put money in your 401k and your IRAs, you shouldn't stop. Because um, had you continued doing that over the last month, um, you would have taken advantage of what's called dollar cost averaging, meaning that when that um, when the market goes down, you buy shares for much less. So what was at one time, let's say $25 a share pre-coronavirus, it may have gone down to $15 a share, which means you would have bought a lot more shares of your mutual funds in your 401k or IRA for the same amount of money. So you want to continue if you can, um, and definitely the last thing you want to do is move your money out into cash um, and sit there because then what happens is when the market does recover, like it has a lot of already, uh, you may sell on that recovery. Does that make sense? Yep, that does make sense. Yes. It's, so, it's, um, yeah, kind of so, like watching, yeah. kind of like watching gold. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw. Probably everybody's been following gold, but it was interesting to see. Gold was like twelve fifty an ounce, um, you know, before this whole thing started, and then like it was interesting to watch it. But I think within a week it was sixteen fifty or something like that. So four hundred dollars an ounce increase in like a week, and um, you know, it, it's a, you wish you could predict that, you know, to go, oh, I'm gonna go buy gold because tomorrow it's gonna go up four hundred dollars an ounce, and then I'm gonna sell it. But that's impossible. But that's why I think the wisdom in that long term thinking is, um, you know, don't panic. Because we've got a hundred years of stock market history here, right? Right. And, if, and the last thing you want to do is pull your money out at the wrong time. And most people do. Most people pull out when the market's gone down and they want to buy when the market's super hot. And of course, that's the opposite of what Warren Buffett says to do. Yeah. So you just want to keep on keeping on and know that you're in it for the long term. I mean, unless you're retiring, you know, in the next year or two, um, you, you don't have to be massively conservative um, right now. And so you just keep on keeping on and don't pull out right now until uh, um, ever, really, until, but you just, yeah, you get more conservative at the older you get, but you definitely, uh, you know, I see the faces on here and a lot of you guys are, looks like you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s. None of you should be sitting in bonds right now or should be sitting in cash. You should be in the market and um, stay in the course. So, anyway, I've got some questions here that uh, were emailed to Gabe that he forwarded to me that I'm going to answer. So, are we good for that now? Yep, go for it. All right. So, one of the questions was this person says that they um, are working on paying down things or they've got three credit cards, a couple of student loans. Uh, you know, what's the best way to pay that debt down? And, uh, you know, the question is, you know, do we pay the ones with the higher interest or do a debt consolidation? Um, you know, that's a, that's a big question um, because as soon as you start doing debt consolidations and forgiveness, that kind of stuff, that's when you start messing with your credit. And a lot of you sh probably should know and do know that your credit is very, very, very important. Um, you should guard that with your life, just like taking care of your heart. You should guard your credit big time because when you have bad credit you can't buy stuff and um, you can't get good deals you, you you can't get a good deal on a house loan you can't get a good deal on a car loan and so um you gotta guard that so when i look at this question here you know there's there's honestly this is going to sound goofy but there's two ways of paying that down um i, I mean you're obviously got to pay it but one way is something you know you do what's called a, a debt consolidation i mean not, excuse, not, no a debt roll up excuse me a debt roll up and the way a debt roll-up works is you pay off either the one with the biggest 
balance or the one with the biggest interest rate. Now, again, that's why I said it's kind of, you know, you, you could go either way because because some people are adamant, like, oh, you should definitely pay the one with the biggest interest rate first. It's cost more money. Um, I'm a big believer that you should pay the one that gives you the fastest win. So let's say you had uh, of these three credit cards, let's say one of them is $500, one's $3,000, and one is $8,000. Well, I would say pay off the one that has a $500 balance. And therefore, you take that win and say, okay, the minimum on that one is 50 bucks. So now I'm going to apply that $50 to my second credit card that's $3,000 or $5,000 or whatever it is. And I'm going to start adding that monthly amount to that card. I'm going to work really hard to pay off that next one. And now maybe my minimums between those two was $250. So now I'm going to take that $250 and add that to my biggest credit card that maybe the payment on that was $300. So instead of paying $300 on it, I'm now paying $550. So I get the credit card paid off much, much quicker than if I try to focus on paying off the big one. The $8,000 one first. So you want to pay off those smaller ones. And again, but don't go cool. Now I have an extra hundred bucks a month to blow. That's the wrong thinking. You want to definitely pay it off and take the money you were used to paying on that card, put it to the second one and then put it to the third one. And before you know it, you will be debt free, but you have to make sure too, as even Dave Ramsey will say, is don't be using those credit cards unless, I mean, there's an absolute like emergency. And I mean, and by the way, your credit cards aren't your emergency fund, but you should not be using credit cards because you have to have a new 75 inch TV. It's cool as those are when you walk into Costco. Trust me, I'm loving that thing. And I wish I had one right now in front of me, but we don't need a 75 inch TV. Um, you know, it's interesting how I remember uh, years ago, we had this thing called the bus ministry. We used to pick up these kids on the bus. And I remember parents would be like, Hey, can you send my, you know, send my kid to a uh, skate world or wherever. And it was like a dollar or $2. And they'd ask the church to pay for it. And it's interesting because I say, well, why is that? And they go, well, we don't have any money. And I think to myself, you don't have a dollar, $2 or $3. And what was interesting, and I looked in the house, and you know what I see? A big screen TV, VCR, big old stereo system, 3,000 CDs, 3,000 DVDs, or whatever. So it's not that we can't do these things. It's that we don't prioritize our money properly. We look at our money and go, hey, cool, I've got an extra 500 bucks. Now I'm going to go buy a new TV. Now I'm going to go buy a new this. And why? Because we convince ourselves that we deserve it, right? We're like, I deserve this. I work really hard. But then all of a sudden, emergency like the coronavirus comes and if you're an average American you go crap I got four hundred dollars in my bank account and my income just dropped in half what do I do um I'm so thankful that they taught me this business that I'm in to save money because when things like this happen I'll be honest with you we just kind of move forward business as usual because we work really hard to save for these kind of rainy days we, we're not sitting there you know blowing everything we made and then be like Oh, shoot, we should have saved, but it's a little too late. So pay down the small one that gets you the win, and then eventually get up to the big one. That'll help you. Good big time. Um, and then, of course, one of the other questions was, um, what's an ideal amount to have in your emergency fund? I caught Gabe talking about this a little earlier on the, on the Zoom here. Um, you know, the rule of thumb is three to six months your income. Um, you, you guys, don't fool yourself that $400 or $1,000 is going to do anything in your emergency fund. I would tell you before I go buy a car with a three, four, five hundred dollar month payment, before I go buy a bunch of stuff at Costco, I would have three to six months, ideally six months of living expenses. So if your living expenses is four thousand a month, times that by six, because that's what you need to have in the bank. And that may, that's a big number by the way, because I know Dave says a thousand, right? That's the beginning win. But you realistically have to have three to six months because when this stuff happens, what are you going to do? And the only thing you're going to be able to do is fall back on what you have. We can't sit back and hope that, you know, Uncle Trump or Uncle Sam or Uncle whoever is going to keep sending us money. That's not the way it works. And, and like Gabe said, we'll pay for that later. All of us will pay for that later. And so we need to have minimum three months of living expenses. Six months would be better. Um, that's that. Okay, let me go to another question. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so the question is, how do we invest our CARES money? Uh, we have no debt uh, except our mortgage. We have 
uh, we also have two, we have some girls that go to elementary school. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, how to invest that? It's going to go back to the emergency fund number one. Um, I love helping people set up retirement plans. I love people having life insurance. I, it always blows me away when I find out people don't have life insurance. Their, their, their life insurance plan is that they hope that their living spouse is going to set up a GoFundMe for them if they pass away. That's not life insurance. Um, you should have life insurance. You should have retirement plans. But if I was getting this CARES money, as we all are, I mean, everybody, I mean, I think, well, most of you, but I, maybe I will. But uh, when this CARES money comes through for all of you, um, I would make sure that, that money goes into the bank to save. Now, like Gabe says, if you are struggling to just put food on the table or pay your rent um, or pay your bills, then yeah, the CARES money needs to go toward that, number one. But if you've got income coming in where you can pay your bills and you want to invest that money, first thing I would do is make sure I've got that three to six month emergency fund. If I already have that, then I would put money into a Roth IRA or some kind of IRA um, in order to have some money for retirement. Um, that's what I would do with that. Hey Tim, let me let me take a crack. Let me jump to a couple. Yeah. Let me take a crack at number one real quick uh, on our list, or, or one of the questions that you and I are looking at. Um, it says, when you have little to no money coming in, what should be the priority? Bills are paid for April, but going into May, I'll be dancing. My encouragement, and here's why I'm jumping into this, to share on this one, Tim, is that uh, we get asked a lot as a church. I mean, uh, churches are known for you know people go, hey, I'm going to ask the church for help. We get a lot of requests for financial help. Um, we could never, ever, ever fulfill all the requests we get for financial help. Um, so we have to be real picky and real choosy on what we do. What we've found is that like all other organizations that, that try to help, um, rent is the biggest request and it's also the most dangerous for us to fulfill. Um, and so almost nobody's going to help you with rent. I, I just as a rule, you, you almost never will get help with rent. What you will get help with is utilities and uh, food. And so my encouragement would be pay your rent, pay your rent, pay your rent. Go find help for food. Like we have at Food Brigade, many you know, places can help with food. Food Brigade is one of the best because you get um, really good food and all kinds of food, meat, produce, all this stuff, and it's free. Saturdays uh, here in Aloha uh, in uh, 185th and Farmington, just come in the morning and you can get food. The other thing is a lot of places do have some funding for electrical and utilities. So if you're trying to figure out, gosh, how do we balance all of this? My encouragement, because what's more important than a, pl a roof over your head would be get the rent paid. Don't get behind on that because that's a permanent problem. If that, if that goes away, whereas look, it's not fun to have your electricity shut off, but you could live, you know, and get through that. And especially if you communicate with your creditor. So that'd be my encouragement on that one. Uh, let me comment on a couple of these. Uh, I've just got more. Um, this person sent in basically saying that uh, they're out of work right now, but they're doing some odd jobs. And uh, with this, you know, do I still tie my 10%? Do I still save 10%? Um, do I skip saving because I'm making 40% less? Obviously, if you're just getting unemployment. And uh, I think we've kind of answered that a little bit as Gabe has talked about, but man, if your income was 4,000 a month and now it's 2,000 a month. Um, obviously, uh, your income is way down. And here's the thing about, let's just start with the first question was here, was tithing. The problem with messing around with tithing is that it's, it's, God's, or it's God ordained and uh, it's how the, the church functions. And it, nowhere in the Bible can I find that it says, hey, if things are rough, stop tithing, stop giving to your local church. Um, I can't find it anywhere there. It just, it just says tithe. So whether I'm making, uh, you know, a thousand dollars a month, I'm going to, I'm going to tithe a hundred dollars. If I'm making 10,000 a month, I'm going to tithe a thousand dollars. And here's the thing about it is when we start messing with that, that's when we kind of release God's ability to really bless us. Cause now we're not doing what we should be doing right off the top. And so tithing is something that you really, especially in a time like that right now, I wouldn't mess with it because if you don't have the blessing on that $2,000, that's going to be real tough for you. It's going to be a tough time um, moving forward because here's what I know about tithing. God shows up all the time with us. I mean, it is crazy how many times God will be like, 
I'll think something's going to cost a thousand bucks and then I'll send those, someone will say, oh, no, no, it's on me or it's $500. It's half the cost or, or, or I thought something was bad. And then I found out, I looked on YouTube, I fixed it for 50 cents or it seems like God is always showing up in our household and he's taking care of my family financially. I mean, some of you may or may not know, but when I started working with the, the, the youth at the church here uh, four years ago, I started taking half of my time that I used to run my business over to the church ministry to work with students. And obviously when you're not focused as much on your business, your income from your business is gonna come down, which it has, but you know what's crazy? We've had zero wants and zero needs, as you say, needs, because God just keeps showing up, even though I'm working over here in student ministries, making not a lot of dough, as you can imagine, but God has still shown up and blessed us, even though my income from the business has come down over the years, but Again, if we're being faithful to giving, God just keeps showing up. And so I would not mess with tithing, period. Even if your income goes down to 500 bucks, then now, can I still save that 10%? Well, it's, it's you should, but again, if, I, if it was me, I'm gonna hit that tithe number one, and then I'm gonna pay my bills so my family has heat, has water, has food, has a place to live. And I, so should I pull back? Am I 401k being maxed out? Yes. You know, absolutely, because you can't keep up with that if you're making half the income with what you were putting in your 401k. So you should pull back on that, absolutely. But don't don't stop tithing, don't stop saving, at least in that emergency fund if you can. But if it comes down to worst case scenario, pay your bills. But don't forget, don't don't stop tithing because you gotta have that blessing from God. That's great. Um, hey, we're gonna have to cut it there so we can end on time. Um, but let's do this. Uh, we are gonna have a copy of what's in the chat as well as the rest of these questions. and. Um, what I'd like to do is work with Tim to get some of these other questions answered and get them emailed to you because I'm going to be emailing everybody the show notes, which has all the kind of data we were talking about and, and, and answers and, and principles, um, as well as some links that will be helpful for you moving forward. Some of you have asked about different resources and stuff, and that'll include that. Um, and then we can include some of our quick answers to some of these questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, okay? Um, I do want to say a huge, huge thank you for your investment in your own financial health. And um, what, a, what a way to be somebody that can be a blessing to others in this season. And I just thank you so much for doing that. Um, I want to take a second to announce the uh, winner. Whoops, I went too far. The winner of the uh, random selection. And it was, it was a number. Uh, and it was the, the seventh person on my screen from the top. Uh, ends up being Stephanie. Stephanie Tripp, you're the winner of the little prize pack, which is the uh, Treasure Principal book, the uh, 649 Tap House gift card, as well as the Amazon gift card. So let's all give Stephanie a hand. Yay. Good job, you guys. Thanks for being on this. And uh, I want to just give you one last thought and then be looking in your email for some other resources. And of course, be uh, sticking with us uh, in connecting in community. I hope you're Hope you're attending online services at westsidecommunitychurch.com. I hope that you uh, are reaching out to your uh, fellow, you know, believers and, and leaning in. And I hope that you're leaning in even to growth groups. These, these are incredible times to be a part of things like that. Um, but here's the last thought that I want to leave you. And that's this verse in Psalm 18 too. This is probably going to be the biggest difference maker in this crisis. COVID-19, you know, it's going to be a while that the economy is down. When, when it gets this drastic, it doesn't bounce back right away. Uh, you know, if you've been watching the news, all of the comparisons are going back into the 1920s and 1930s as far as how back you have to, how far back you have to go to see it get this bad, this fast. And um, and so we will be in a season of economic downturn for a little while. But if the Lord is your rock, if He is your fortress, if He is your savior in whom you find protection. If he's your shield and the power that saves you and your place of safety, you can't be shaken. And you will be one of those people that are standing on a rock in the middle of a storm and, and people are gonna start looking to you going like, can you please tell me how you did that? And you're gonna have a chance to make a difference in people's lives because everybody's thinking about money. And, and so how you respond in this time to the financial challenges that are in your life and, and in the lives of those around you will, will determine how many people you impact in this season. This could be the most significant season of our lifetimes as it relates to making an impact for Jesus. Some of you care deeply about that. 
this is your time to shine. Um, it's how we handle this time. So I love Tim. Are you still on with us? I am here. Okay. Would you be willing to close us in prayer and just thank God for being our rock? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for, um, oh, you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we just thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. And uh, thank you so much for all these that are on this Zoom call right now, Lord, that they just, uh, you know, just want a little direction. And uh, we all do. And I just pray that everyone can take a little bit of what they learned today and apply it to their lives. And that uh, I pray, Lord, that you'll just bless them just for the fact that they jumped on this call today just because uh, they, they wanted some direction. I pray that that you'll give them the hope and give them the focus and the direction they need to go. And that uh, we just love you, Lord. And we just thank you for loving us and blessing us and help us to uh, not be fearful, to just know that you're in control. You've got this whole thing figured out. And uh, you just uh, give us a great week this week. And we love you. Amen.